Part One. Question One. You are watching this quiz show on TV. The contestant is answering questions on A. History. B. Current affairs. C. Geography. So here are the questions on the subject you've chosen to win tonight's star prize. Take your time now. You have ten seconds to think before you have to answer each question. Okay, good. And here's your first question: Who was shot in Sarajevo in 1914 by Gavrilo Princip? Take your time now before you answer. Question two. You are thinking of going to watch a football match, but you are not sure what to wear. You phone the weather line, hear this message, and decide to wear a a t-shirt and shorts, b a raincoat, c a warm coat with gloves and scarf. Thank you for calling the Saturn Telephone Weather Line. Here is the weather forecast for today, Tuesday, the twenty-first of March. Today will be cloudy and overcast, but with only a ten percent chance of rain. Winds will be light to moderate, but it will be near freezing all day with icy patches on the roads. So take care if you're driving. There'll be a heavy frost tonight with temperatures as low as minus five degrees Celsius. The long-range forecast is for snow towards the end of the week. Question three. You hear this item on the radio news. The painting by Titian has been a lost, b stolen, c found. Rest on the flight to Egypt is probably the only small-scale Titian in private hands. Painted in 1510 and 1511, when Titian, the founder of high Renaissance painting in Venice, was in his early twenties. The painting's small size may well have made it attractive to thieves, as it could easily be carried. Titian expert Dr. Paul Sherman of Cambridge University said, "It is a lovely little thing, a little gem, and it is very sad that it has disappeared. Only a couple of other small pictures by Titian are known: one in Bergamo, Italy, and one in the Metropolitan Museum in New York." Question four: You are booked on flight TA two zero four one to New York. And you are waiting in the departure lounge at Heathrow Airport when you hear this announcement. You go to A, the exit; B, gate twenty; C, hospitality suite B. Transatlantic Airlines regret to announce the cancellation of flight TA two zero four one to San Francisco via Shannon, New York, and Chicago. Passengers for Ireland should go immediately to the main exit. A bus will take you to Gatwick, where an alternative flight has been arranged. Passengers for San Francisco have been transferred and should join flight VG three six five from gate twenty when this is called. Arrangements are still being made for passengers for New York and Chicago. If these passengers would like to go to Hospitality Suite B, a complimentary buffet has been arranged. Question five. You hear these two people talking. They are a brother and sister, b husband and wife, c friends. Let's go somewhere exciting this year. You say that every year, and every year we end up staying with your sister in Blackpool. I know, but this year I want to do something different. Like go to Blackpool without your sister. Be sensible. I want to go abroad, to see something exciting and get some sun. We haven't been abroad since our honeymoon, and that's twenty-five years ago. Ah, now I see. Well, it is our anniversary, and the kids have said they'll pay for our tickets as a treat. Question six. This telephone call is overheard. It takes place in a a theatre booking office, b an airline booking office, c a travel agency. 
A transfer? Yes, I'm sure we can transfer your ticket. What's the date of the performance? The 24th. I'll just call that up on the screen. OK. Now, what number's your seat? X3. X3. OK. And where would you like to move to? I see. Somewhere nearer the front. How about E1? That's available. Don't worry about that. All seats have a good view. Now, I've made the change. Shall I send you the new ticket, or would you like to pick it up? Question 7. In this conversation, Maria is asking George A. to write her essay, B. to read her essay, C. to help her with her essay. George? Yes? You know that essay we were set on drugs and modern society? Oh, yeah, that one. What about it? Have you written it, then? Oh, yeah, ages ago. Why, haven't you? Well, not exactly. That's to say I haven't actually started it yet. Maria, so what do you want? You don't expect me to write it for you, do you? No, no, of course not. I just thought you might give me a few pointers, if you know what I mean. Pointers? What sort of pointers? Well, you could start by telling me which books you used. Question 8. You overhear this conversation when you are travelling on A. A plane B. A bus C. A train Excuse me, sir. I'm sorry. This compartment is non-smoking. Could you please put out your cigarette? But I've only just lit it. I know, sir, and I'm sorry. But this is non-smoking, as the signs on the windows show quite clearly. The other passengers are complaining. Can't I just open a window? I'm sorry, sir. If you want to smoke, you must move to a smoking compartment. There's one in the next carriage, just after the buffet car. That's the end of part one. I've been visiting Master Nunder Moore, a quiet rural haven deep in the Suffolk countryside. A place at first glance that seems idyllic with its green fields and quiet lanes. But it is also, according to American sociologist Martin Borstein, a society so divided by class and wealth that it is ready for revolution. I thought I'd find out more by speaking to some of the inhabitants. I asked Major Ronnie Wentworth, chairman of the parish council, who lives in the 16th century manor house, how much he mixes with the residents of the housing estate at the other end of the village. I think we all mix quite a bit. Marsden's a small village, so we all know each other. I'm sure I'd know everybody's name if I called in at the pub. But I wouldn't invite them all around for drinks, would I? They're just not my close friends. Retired surgeon Alan Morgan tells the same story. I don't think we're divided at all. In fact, we're a very united village. Only last month we had our annual village fete. Everyone joined in and we raised money for a local charity. Of course, there are some divisions, but there are no real conflicts. But are these divisions class divisions in a way Professor Borstein would have us believe? The oldest village inhabitant, Madeline Squire, now 97, and a child when Queen Victoria was on the throne, recalls the days when her father owned most of the village and the land around it. We led such a lovely life then. Nowadays, everyone works so hard. But then we had a butler, two cooks and maids and gardeners. If I went to a party and came back late, I had just instruct the butler to wake me after eight hours with black coffee. And they called father, sir. And I was miss to everybody. You don't hear that today. Everyone is so rude. Well, that's more like the sort of social division I was expecting from Professor Borstein's book. But old Mrs. Squire thinks it's vanished. I make one last attempt to find the class war and visit the local pub, the Moor's Head, where the last vestige of physical class division is still to be seen. The lounge bar for the middle classes, 
and the saloon bar for the workers. I pick out the scruffiest labourer from a group who have come to relieve their hunger and thirst after laying the pavement outside. Does he feel divided from people like Major Wentworth and Dr Morgan? Would he want to overthrow them in the name of the class war? Not likely. I'm only doing this for the summer vacation to earn some money, and then I go back to medical college. That's the end of part two. Speaker one. Oh, it was terrible, really. We took the 15 day Eastern extravaganza and we travelled overland from Montreal to Washington, calling it, where was it now? Ottawa and Boston. That was lovely. And New York with all the sights. And we stopped at Niagara Falls. We'd always wanted to see that. But it was going down to Philadelphia that we found things going wrong. I know I put the bags on the coach. I remember doing it and then going and sitting in the back seat. And the journey was marvellous with the colours of all the leaves. But when we arrived in Philadelphia, we found the bags gone. We just didn't know what to do. Speaker 2. We were travelling, well, driving mostly, through New England. It's a really pretty place, especially in the autumn, or the fall, as the locals call it. Actually, you can hardly understand them, the accent's so thick. But anyway, we stopped for tea at Deerfield, which has a mile-long street where the buildings are pure 18th century. And we found a lady who would make us tea, and we got chatting the way you do. And it turned out we had the same name, Harding. And more than that, her family had originally come from the same village as mine. Isn't that strange? Speaker 3 we stopped off in Quebec to do a bit of sightseeing and we had half a day to spare before going on to North Hatley. And we were in the old town and it's terrible really because they still have the old streets with rocks, you know, what you call it, cobbles. Well, it was really difficult to walk and I turned my ankle. I knew something was wrong because it was really difficult to walk. Oh, it was awful. And we kept stopping people and asking for help but no one seemed to understand us. Speaker... Four. We were staying at the Holiday Inn in San Diego, just relaxing and, and, and doing nothing. And, and it's got this fabulous view of the harbour. Uh, and there was this one bridge that looked so picturesque, uh, so we thought we'd have a photograph taken on the bridge. Well, we, we asked this man if he would photograph us. And he was delighted, but he, he said he had trouble getting us in. So he kept backing up and backing up, then... Um, Suddenly he turned round and ran off with a camera. What a nerve. I, I, I suppose we should have known better, really. Speaker 5. Well, it was dreadful. It's the only word for it. The hotel was like a prison camp. What a great place for holiday. We complained there and then, but the rep refused to move us, so we went out for a meal. The area is supposed to be famous for its shellfish, and within an hour the wife went down with salmonella poisoning, and I went down with heat stroke. We spent the whole week in our room, so of course we didn't get to see a thing. The room overlooked a rubbish tip, and the old place was filthy. That's the end of part three. Good evening, Mrs Adams. I I I'm sorry to barge in on you like this, but I I'd like a word with you about your son, Brian. Well... It's a bit inconvenient. We've only just sat down to dinner. Oh, I can't help that. I, I'm afraid it's something that I've, I've got to get off my chest and it won't wait a moment longer. I've weighed up all the pros and cons and decided that I have to have it out with you. Oh, all right. I suppose you'd better come in. Thank you. Well, Mrs Adams, the fact is that on Tuesday night I, I clearly saw your Brian on the other side of the road spraying graffiti on the bakery wall. He and his friends seemed to think it was a great laugh, but I'm anything but amused. What's this, Mum? What's he saying I've been up to now? He's always got something against me, never anybody else. Just a moment, Brian. Let's see the full story. What makes you so sure it was Brian? I'm amazed you could see anything. The street lights around here aren't so good, you know. They don't have to be to recognise someone with a bright orange anorak. It was Brian, all right, and 
I want to know what you're going to do about it. Just a moment. Let's leave my mum out of it, shall we? I'm a big boy now. I can answer for what I do. I don't need a bodyguard. I agree. You can't expect me to stand over him all day. I don't care who takes the blame as long as the damage is put right. We all live here. We've got to bring the neighbourhood up to scratch. Keep it smart. Otherwise, it won't be worth living in. I suggest you mind your own business. It's not us that bring the tone of the neighbourhood down. You're not the only one with complaints, you know. There's the little matter of who owns dogs around here and the mess they make on the pavement. <laughs> Look, I don't want to argue about this. Uh, after all, we are neighbours. Let's just drop the whole thing, shall we? That's the end of part four. That's the end of the test. Please stop now. Goodbye.